Moving swiftly on, the next item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 14089 in the name of Christina McKelvey on extra spending on home of nuclear submarines. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. I'd invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. I'd also invite members who are leaving the chamber to do so quickly and quietly, and I would further invite members of the public who are leaving the chamber also to please leave quickly and quietly. I now call on Christina McKelvey. Ms McKelvey, you have seven minutes, please. Thank you very much, President Officer. President Officer, there are some issues in this world that are far too big for party politics. Immigration and the protections of refugees is one. World poverty is another. International terrorism, religious extremism, and I'm sure my colleagues could um, cite many, many more. Nuclear weapons, Trident renewal, £100 billion wasted on having the capacity to wipe out half the world at the press of a button. And why? Presiding officer, by taking a stand on these immoral, destructive and abhorrent weapons of mass destruction, we in Scotland are making a global statement. There is only one political party that I see that is clearly, unequivocally dedicated to stopping that renewal. That is the SNP and my friends in the Greens. <laughs> okay. But of course, being part of the UK family of nations, we are not allowed the right to say no renewal. And all of this weaponry is sitting in the estuary at the back of our largest city, and we can hardly be surprised that 80% of the Scottish people don't want it replaced. In this place, members have repeatedly and conclusively voiced their opposition. Two members, and I believe now three members of the opposition benches, Neil Finlay, Elaine Smith and Malcolm Chisholm, have signed this motion because they too want to see investment in people instead of in weapons of mass destruction. And I have to commend them all for their integrity and their willingness to rise above the political mudslinging that remains at the background of this debate. Meanwhile, you always, you always let the side down, Neil, don't you? You always let the side down. Meanwhile, Westminster's welfare cuts risk putting up to 100,000 more children in poverty in 2020. The Child Poverty Action Group has estimated that Scotland's child poverty rate will increase by between 50 and 100,000 people by 2020 as a result of the UK Government's tax and benefits policy. Within the UK, Scotland is part of an increasingly unequal society. Far too many people trapped in poverty and prevented from releasing their full potential. The UK ranks 28th out of 34 nations in the ORCF on a measure of overall inequality. And academic studies, according to Darling, suggest that comparing the earnings of the worst off and the best off has found that the UK was around the fourth most unequal nation amongst the world's richest countries. Presiding officer, as a lifelong supporter of nuclear disarmament, I don't want to see Trident reinvented or reinstalled anywhere else in the UK or beyond. But I firmly believe that people living in the area closest to such a weapon of mass destruction should have some voice over whether they are happy to have it there. To have its mammoth vehicles driving around Glasgow's main roads under the cover of darkness with attached wrists that are terrifying. And we heard from William McNeely, who got himself into serious trouble. The Royal Navy submariner said in May that the nuclear deterrent was, and I quote, a disaster waiting to happen. He cited 70 safety lapses in the transportation of nuclear warheads between June, ju sorry, July 2007 and December 2012. And they included trucks getting lost, suddenly losing power and suffering brake failures and breakdowns, as well as driving the wrong way up a motorway and losing communications. Presiding officer, this week we've heard George Osborne style himself as Bob the Builder. And I think he's the kind of builder that you're likely to see on television programmes like Rogue Traders or Cowboy Builders. You know, the ones who promise you the best, but what you get is shoddy workmanship and an overinflated price. So let's look at what £500 million would build in Scotland. It would build around 63 primary schools. Or how about 20 secondary schools? Or how would you feel about 20 community hospitals being built in Scotland? 
the subsequent jobs created from the planners and architects to the builders and labourers to the local cafe and the sandwich shops feeding this workforce. And of course, the increased tax take from these jobs and the boost that that gives, not just to local economies, but to national economies. Then there could be the extra 1,350 teachers we could have, or maybe 1,650 newly trained nurses in our hospitals. So what do we get for £500 million for Mr Bob the Builder Osborne? Well, we get some tarmac and maybe a higher fence, not to protect jobs or people, but to protect an immoral arsenal of weapons of mass murder. How can anybody justify having the power to wipe out half the world? Why, why is that a useful attribute to have? The real threat to the world peace comes from extremist terrorists as in 9-11 or through the apparently irreconcilable divide between Israel and Palestine that has left less to so many tragic deaths of civilian women and children in Gaza or in the devastation wreaked by ISIS in Syria, or the millions of refugees now seeking sanctuary on Europe's shores, is anybody seriously suggesting that nuclear weapons will act as a deterrent to Daesh? I don't think so. Presiding officer, Mr Osborne always talked about investment. Trident is just a big investment in global murder, a bigger investment than some of the warring factions that we've heard of in the Middle East. So how about Mr Osborne investing in infrastructure? What about investing in a social security system that supports and protects vulnerable people? How about ending the need for children to go to food banks? Some of the children I've seen when I spent time at the food bank in Hamilton on Saturday. And Osborne the builder, how about building peace in our world by taking the brave step to say we will not spend one more hard-earned taxpayers' penny on weapons of mass murder? How about building a consensus around the world? On this, the 70th anniversary of the UN, how about building a consensus around the world that peace and diplomacy is the only way to make our world safer for us all? How about building a reputation of a fairer, greener nation that has the guts to step away from the nu nuclear bombs and steps towards disarmament? How about, presiding officer, putting burns before bombs? Thank you. Thank you so much. Now call on Jackie Bailey to be followed by Animal Goldie. Presiding officer, I believe in multilateral nuclear disarmament, and I don't think anybody in this chamber, indeed out with it, would want to see nuclear weapons used. I want all nations to give up nuclear weapons. And my ambition, and I know it's one that's shared across this chamber, is actually to achieve global zero. And whilst I absolutely respect the position of unilateralists, I don't believe that that action alone will trigger other nations to reduce their weapons. But let me return to the detail of the motion and the announcement by the Chancellor of the Exchequer of £500 million of investment for Faslane. Let's be clear that this is 50 million every year for 10 years, so it's not upfront money, is to build ship lifts, sea walls, and jetties. It's a direct consequence of the decision taken by the last Labour government to make Faslane the submarine base for the whole of the United Kingdom. So the money is for important infrastructure to allow that to happen, and something, frankly, I thought the SNP would welcome. Because after all, in an attempt to answer the pressing question about jobs in the local economy, the SNP's position is to come up with the notion of having the headquarters for all of the forces based at Faslane. So surely infrastructure for that purpose is welcome because it enhances the base and creates construction jobs in the local economy. Let me talk about jobs for a minute and then I'll take an intervention from the Cabinet Secretary. Because there's much contention about numbers, with the SNP, in my view, deliberately downplaying the figures, claiming that something like 500 people are affected. Let me share with the Chamber a recent FOI made to the Ministry of Defence in September 2014. Here's what it said. 6,800 people working at Faslane at the end of August 2014. Now, let me just point out, that's 300 more than I thought were there. So that is welcome indeed. 4,500 extra on top of that 
in the supply chain and according to standard income multipliers. That comes from an ECOS study. So we have 11,300 people employed at Faslane. And you know what? They expect 2,000 more as a result of the changes. So we're talking 13,300 jobs. I'm happy to give way to the Cabinet Secretary, who's going to explain how he's going to replace them. Cabinet Secretary. Hey, I well understand that for many years, Jackie Bailey has justified spending billions of pounds on nuclear weapons in terms of the jobs that she believes it sustains. But is she aware of the April 2015 report by the STUC and Scottish CND not the Tory government, but by the STUC and Scottish CND, the Trident and Jobs, which found that many more jobs would be created if the same amounts of money spent on Trident were instead spent on public infrastructure. Do you know, what, what's interesting is, you know, I kind of expected that because that is the default position. You know, if you were actually serious, actually understood what the workforce know, what the dogs in the street in my community know, there are far many more jobs there than the, the figure quoted. So if you want to be responsible for your actions, as I believe mature politics is all about, then let's start with at least admitting the true scale of the job losses in that area. Do you know, it is the biggest single site employer, probably in the west of Scotland, definitely in the west of Scotland, probably in all of Scotland. More than a quarter of the Western Bartonshire workforce employed at Faslane are employed in good quality, well-paid jobs. Christina McKelvey's speech touched on jobs briefly, I will grant that. She talked about teachers, schools and hospitals. She talked about using the 500 million to do that. Well, it must be a very elastic sum of money because actually if you look at the new Southern General Hospital, that costs, I believe, in excess of £900 million to build. So that money isn't going to go very far. But actually, what is inherently dishonest about this is that the SNP say, we'll take this money and we'll use it on teachers, nurses, schools and hospitals, but the reality is their policy position is to invest it in conventional weapons. Not one new penny would be diverted into the kind of social um, projects that Christina McKelvey talks about. So the SNP are guilty of spending the money not just once, not just twice, but even perhaps ten times over, and it is dishonest to have a position where simply you would be happy for the nuclear weapon to be moved south of the border and actually not to try and achieve global zero. My bottom line is, do you know, as politicians, we have to be mature and responsible in our politics. And brief. If you're going to take something away, then at least have the courtesy to tell that local workforce where the jobs for the future are going to come from. Thank you, presiding officer. Thanks. And I now call on Annabel Goldie to be followed by Christian Allard. Four minutes. So thereby, please. Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm pleased to contribute to this debate, but I might uh, make a passing observation that addressing such a significant issue as defence in any meaningful fashion within the four minutes permitted in a member's debate is impossible. So let me, in abbreviate form, and I would not propose to take intervention, set out my observations. I do this as a West of Scotland member, and my area includes the communities of Dumbarton, Cardross, Vale of Leave, and Helensborough, Rue, Fastlane, and the Gairloch. And I have previously asked the Scottish Government about its response to the additional investment recently announced by the Chancellor at the Fastlane base. I am a firm supporter of the UK Government's proposals to turn Fastlane into the UK's submarine centre of specialisation, planning ahead to secure the base's future until at least 2067. Now, it's strangely lost in the motion is what was actually announced by the uh, Chancellor. The money, £500 million of it over 10 years, will, as Jackie Bailey indicated, be spent on a number of major projects at the base, including the construction of ship lifts, sea walls and jetties, to allow the base to serve not only Trident and its successor, but Britain's fleet of conventional submarines too. Now, I am aware the SNP opposes nuclear weapons, but in this case we are seeing that opposition turn into something quite different. It has now become opposition to equipping our armed forces, opposition to having the best quality facilities available for our submariners, entirely regardless of whether they are serving with nuclear or conventional weapons. And it's opposition to hundreds of millions of pounds worth of investment, securing thousands of highly skilled jobs in the Clyde, supporting numerous businesses and providing enormous boost to the local economy in the west of Scotland. 
Fastlane is already Scotland's largest single site employer, and this money will see the staff of 6,700 expanded to 8,200. This is an asset for Scotland. It's one I'm sure which other parts of the UK look at with envy. And I, I'm surprised that Ms McKelvey seems to regret that the UK government will meet our NATO commitment to spend 2% of our national income on defence. A strange opinion, you might suppose, from a party that just over a year ago was singing the praises of NATO membership. Or is it a case of the SNP once again cynically suggesting money can be spent several times over in countless different things. I know during the referendum campaign that was certainly where they stood on Trident because the cost of these submarines, which is around 5 or 6 per cent of our defence budget, was earmarked by the SNP in the event of independence for additional spending on conventional forces, childcare, to combat youth unemployment, to invest in colleges, to provide additional social security payments, to spend in hospitals, schools, <coughs> personal care, pensions, infrastructure, diplomatic missions overseas. <clears throat> Deputy Deciding Officer, these aspirations may be laudable, but there is nothing laudable in inflating the cost of our nuclear deterrent and pretending that getting rid of it will give access to a bottomless pit of public money. And I'm pleased that the Conservative government is meeting its targets, not just in defence, but in international development aid too, because that is the sort of investment that a strong economy enables. It is positive not only for the UK's interests, but also for the global reach of our armed forces and international development programmes. The motion also points to the supposed unpopularity of the nuclear deterrent, deterrent amongst the Scottish public. Now, this may well be a matter of faith for Ms McKelvey and her party, but it is at odds with the evidence with several polls finding support for the deterrent. But that aside, however, this £500 million announcement is not about Trident. It is about equipping a key base for the future for both the conventional and nuclear submarines it will serve. We should applaud that announcement, not condemn it. Thank you so much. I now call on Christian Allard to be followed by Neil Finlay. Thank you. Uh, you are probably familiar with those men who are worried about their own virility and buy large sports cars. And this presenting officer, I don't know if you are one of them, is a case in point when talking about the people wanting to renew the UK nuclear weapon system. One of those men said, our independent nuclear deterrent is not independent and doesn't constitute a deterrent against anybody but to regard as an enemy. It's a waste of money. This was from former UK Defence Secretary Michael Portillo. He's right on that point. He would prefer the £500 million to be spent on conventional weapons and troops. Was Michael Portillo cynical, I ask Annabel Goldie? I don't think he was. Another man and another former UK Defence Minister, Nick Harvey, also dismissed the argument uh, of wider economic benefits of replacing Trident. His words, the idea that you should produce weapons of mass destruction in order to keep 1,500 jobs going in the battle ship shipyard is simply ludicrous. And he added, frankly, you could give them all a couple of million quid and send them to the Bahamas for the rest of their lives, and you would have saved an awful lot of money. That should answer some of the Jackie Bellis claim. Here you are, President Officer. Ideas from two men, two former UK Defence Ministers, are now not to spend the £500 million on fast lane. I wish we had thought about that when we were in charge. I like the idea of making sure that our boys and girls serving at home and abroad are well looked after. The idea of spending the rest of your life in the Bahamas is also appealing. Thank you to Christina McKelvey for bringing this debate to the Chamber. It is clear that we need to keep the pressure on the UK government to stop spending our money when Westminster has yet to take the decision to renew Trident or not. Last week, after Bill Skid's debate, we met Austrian Ambassador Alexander Kemnet who was instrumental in initiating the humanitarian pledge to call for the prohibition and elimination of nuclear weapons, a pledge supported by 117 countries. That's kind of consensus uh, across the world that Christina McElvey was talking about. We must listen to voices from the majorities of countries in the world calling for the complete prohibition and elimination of nuclear weapons. At the meeting, we heard from Dr. Claire Duncanson, lecturer in international relationships of the University of Edinburgh, explaining that women 
being sidelined from decision making is one of the most obvious way in which gender affects this issue. Building on Carol Cohn's work on the subject, she highlighted how in international security debates certain dichotomies prevail with the masculine associated side of terms used being valued higher. Claire Duncanson illustrated a work with this story from a male physicist, a member of a group of nuclear physicists. Several colleagues and I were working on modeling counter-force nuclear attacks, trying to get realistic estimates of the number of immediate fatalities that would result from different deployments. At what point, I said, we removed a particular attack using slightly different assumptions and found that instead of there being 36 million immediate fatalities, there'd only be 30 million. The male physicist presenting officer added that everybody who was sitting at the round table was nodding and saying, oh yeah, that's great, only 30 million, when all of a sudden he realized what they were saying and he blurted out, wait, I've just heard how we are talking, only 30 million, only 30 million human beings killed instantly. Silence fell upon the room, nobody said a word. They didn't even look at him. The physicist said later how he felt at the time. It's awful. I feel like a woman. And he was careful not to blot out anything like that again. This story, this story and the words from two former UK defence ministers illustrate the role and meaning of gender discourse in the defence community. And again, I would like to thank Christina McKelvey to bring this debate to the Chamber. Presenting officer. Thanks so much. Now call on Neil Finlay to be followed by John Wilson. Thanks, President Officer. I want to speak uh, briefly in this debate uh, on this motion. Apparently the newspapers and some in the social media were surprised that I had signed this motion, despite uh, having spoken at dozens of meetings over the years and debates in this chamber and having been opposed to nuclear weapons all my political life. Somehow this came as a surprise in news to people. Well, just to get rid of any further doubt, any further doubt whatsoever, I oppose nuclear weapons and I oppose the renewal of Trident. I hope that uh, puts that to bed. But I don't want to uh, present my case in the crude party political terms that Christina McKelvey has done. I thought her speech was thoroughly, thoroughly depressing. That is not how you build alliances and to bring people to your campaign. That's how you ostracise people from your campaign. So, I'll certainly take an intervention. I don't know if the member listened what I said. We had last week a meeting talk with the ambassador, the Austrian ambassador, really about this consensus across the world. I didn't see the member there. You need really to listen and make sure that you involve in these groups. Neil Finlay? Maybe it's Mr Allard who needs, needs to listen because I wasn't referring to him. I was referring to Miss McKelvey. But I will come to you. I will come to you, Mr Allard, in a minute because I thought you actually made a much better speech uh, than Miss McKelvey. So, some think that you win people over in this debate by saying that we are right and you are wrong and if you don't want to get rid of nuclear weapons uh, unilaterally, um, then somehow... You're morally inferior to me, you're less humane than me, and therefore your opinion and views are less worthy. Well, I appeal to anyone who takes that tone to think again, because moral superiority doesn't provide an engineer with a new job, nor does it keep a local shop open, nor does spending the Trident money dozens and dozens of times over in a crude attempt to make party political points during a referendum on our, or an election campaign keep a community alive. Mr Allard was right to reference Portillo and Harvey and others, some of the former generals, um, Nick Brown, a former chief whip uh, for the Labour government, have all come to the conclusion that we shouldn't renew Trident. He's right to reference them because that's what you do. You build alliances of people who are not normally in the same camp to argue against this. That is the way to win people over. And if we're going to take the worst workforce with us, whose jobs are threatened by this, and if we're going to convince people in the supply chain, those businesses, that this is the right move, and I believe it is the right move, then we need to put in place those replacement jobs and services to support the people that are losing them 
and the people in those communities. That is our duty and it's our responsibility in this debate. So I appeal to those, all of those who want to see the world rid of nuclear weapons, whether they are multilateralists or unilateralists. After all, we're all on the same side. We simply disagree on tactics. I appeal to them to work together to further develop a credible and serious defence diversification plan and strategy, not based on any imaginary jobs or fantasy jobs or on throwaway lines in a debate like this, but on real and genuine opportunities for the people involved. If we do that, then we can take forward this agreement and win it. I am absolutely convinced we will win it. But we need to build that alliance to take the argument across society and across the political divide, across the political divide, in order to eradicate these weapons from the world. I want them eradicated from Scotland, the UK and across the world. I don't want to see them sail to, from the Clyde to the Tyne or the Mersey or anywhere else. I want the world to be a much safer place. Finally, President Officer, I at times despair of our politics. In recent weeks, sections of the media have decried Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn for saying he wouldn't be willing to press the button to launch a nuclear attack that could kill millions and pollute the earth for centuries to come. Apparently not being willing to wipe out millions of our fellow be human beings is something to be knocked. Yet someone who is willing to press that button and wipe out, wipe out millions of human beings is to be admired as a strong leader. Well, doesn't that expose the madness of our world at times? President officer, I support someone who works for peace and justice and human rights any day. That's real leadership. Thank you very much. <clears throat> now call on John Wilson, after which we'll move the closing speech from the Minister. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I commend Christina McKelvey for bringing this debate to the Chamber today? And I think the debate is timely in more ways than one. It's timely to highlight the expenditure the UK Government is prepared to put into refitting Faz Lane but also timely to look at the events leading up to today. Three weeks ago, the Daily Record reported on the uh, 19th of September that US Defence sent warning to Putin as Trident sub docks on Clyde armed with ballistic missiles. That wasn't a UK submarine. That was a USSS submarine that docked in Faz Lane a submarine capable of launching 24 nuclear ballistic missiles docked in Faz Lane. And it's estimated by the Daily Record this is the first time that a US nuclear submarine has been in British waters in 10 years. But they can't give any guarantees that it is the first time that a US ballistic nuclear submarine has actually docked, been in UK waters because these submarines operate in secret. Then this is quite surprising. The Daily Record could actually cite this submarine was in Faz Lane. So it's not about refitting Faz Lane to make it the nuclear base, this submarine base for the UK. It's also about making Faz Lane capable of actually bringing in other nuclear submarines from around other nations, including the US. When we look at the situation. This week, the ex NATO exercises, or as we're told <coughs> by NATO themselves, that it's not an official NATO exercise, but we had Prince Charles visited Faz Lane last week to uh, speak to those countries and services that are actually participating in Joint Warrior, an exercise that's taking place off the west coast, coast of Scotland this week that brings together a number of forces as a warning, and many have said in the armed forces, to Putin, to the Russians, to show the military might that can be commanded by NATO if Russia decides to get out of line. The reality is nuclear weapons are being sighted in Faz Lane. Nuclear weapons are being sailed into the base in Faz Lane from other countries. If we're serious about getting rid of nuclear weapons, it's not the Jackie Bailey line of multilateralism. 
because it's big boys' toys that people want to play with and want to own and control. The reality is we are facing a situation in Britain today and in Scotland where people are facing benefit cuts on a daily basis. More families are finding themselves in poverty. And at the same time that is happening, we have a UK government that is deciding to spend £50 million a year in refitting a base that is essentially designed to house the nuclear arsenal for the UK and potentially the nuclear arsenal for other countries in this world. The reality is we have got to be, as a society, mindful of what we're trying to achieve. And if it's one small step for a nation like Scotland or the UK to remove themselves from the nuclear arms race, then that's a step I'm prepared to take and it's a step I'm prepared to support if we can eradicate nuclear weapons from this world and safeguard the world from future destruction and end, use that resource, use that money to tackle the real need of the people in the world, and that's to tackle poverty and injustice. So I commend the motion that's before us today and ask everybody to campaign for the eradication of nuclear weapons and ensure we have a safer, fairer world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we now move the closing speech from the Cabinet Secretary, Keith Brown, up to seven minutes. Please, go on, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I would also like to thank Christina McKelvey for securing this debate. Um, a fortnight ago, you may remember, we debated Bill Kidd's motion on the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons in the Marshall Islands, and a number of speakers then made, I think, compelling arguments against the possession of nuclear weapons on both strategic and on moral grounds. Uh, and as has been said by uh, Christina McKelvey and others, nuclear weapons do not make us more secure and their use would result in huge humanitarian suffering. I would say that to uh, Jackie Bailey, when she makes the argument, the moral argument to justify uh, these nuclear weapons, it's worth thinking about the fact that these weapons can never be used in the targeted way that we see some so-called smart weapons being used. These weapons do not discriminate between huge civilian populations and armies and service personnel. They are indiscriminate, and that's why they're morally wrong uh, and cannot be justified in terms of economic expenditure uh, on them. Uh, today's debate, though, has given members an opportunity to reflect on the economic consequences of the renewal of Trident. And Christina McKelvey's motion draws a powerful contrast between the vast expense of replacing the Trident nuclear weapon system and the impacts of the UK government's welfare reforms on society's most vulnerable. So, while the Chancellor announces £500 million for projects at Faslane linked in substantial part, and I'm happy to provide evidence to anyone that doubts the fact that these are linked to preparing for the introduction of the so-called Trident successor submarines, we do also read press reports that the UN is to investigate whether the UK government's welfare reforms have caused grave or systematic violations of disabled people's human rights. The estimated cost, as we've heard, of replacing the UK's nuclear weapons uh, runs to a staggering £100 billion in lifetime costs at 2012 prices. And as reported last year by the Trident Commission, an independent cross-party inquiry launched in the UK Parliament in 2011. When spending reaches its peak in the next decade, taxpayers will be spending nearly £4 billion a year on nuclear weapons. And the Commission's report spells out the impacts on other areas of defence spending. It's worth bearing in mind that the cost of Trident equates to roughly one-third of the entire capital budget of all three services. Um, so it crowds out the ability to invest properly in defence, uh, uh, conventional defence. It also says that important defence projects currently in the pipeline will suffer delay uh, or cancellation because of this. And yet, as George Osborne's announcement on the 31st of August, £500 million of infrastructure, uh, infrastructure funding at Faslane shows Preparation continues for the next generation of nuclear weapons carrying submarines operating from HMV, uh, HM Naval Base Clyde into the second half of the century and beyond. And it flies in the face of democracy that the UK government is diverting further funds to the future of nuclear weapons before they've placed the final decision on a successor fleet before the UK Parliament. Of course, the Scottish government welcomes investment in Faslane as a conventional naval base. As members will be well aware, we greatly respect, we value and support all members of the armed forces in Scotland, as well as their families and their veterans. Yet alongside plans to replace Trident, the UK has seen deep cuts 
to its conventional forces, which have disproportionately affected Scotland. We've seen massive reductions, disproportionate reductions, I will in just a second, disproportionate reductions uh, to the conventional forces in Scotland. What we've seen is people on the front line in Afghanistan being handed their P-45s as they're serving, regiments uh, merged together by the previous Labour government and cuts in the equipment to defence forces. So I'm happy to hear how Jackie Bailey would defend that. Um, I have no intention of defending that, but let me pose a question to the Cabinet Secretary, because I'm curious to know what the position is. My understanding is his party's policy position is to actually support conventional forces and weapons and divert the money into that. That's when I heard him start to say, that's at odds with what Christina McKelvey said. Uh, not, not at all. I think if you listen to what I've said, that uh, the expenditure, the half a billion pound which has been mentioned, is being spent in order to prepare for the use of the, or the replacement of the Trident nuclear submarines at Faslane, and that's what's objected to. Now, Jackie Bailey says that um, everybody uh, knows the merits of her argument, including the dogs in the street. Well, can I just point out, I think, and I could be wrong on this figure, I think that the SNP MP Martin Doherty got around a 10,000 majority in her area at the general election. I have a feeling that her area voted yes to independence. I think the arguments about nuclear weapons were very prominent in those ways. No, I won't. The arguments were the prominent in that. I wonder if Jackie Bailey could be quite... What's a, please, my Bailey, um, the Cabinet Secretary is not taking an intervention. So, well, and you'll be quiet, please. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. So uh, I, I think what we've seen is uh, real support for the position whereby we could spend this money much more productively and perhaps she, Jackie Bailey wants to see if she can get her other colleagues in the Labour Party on side. Now, it has inevitably strayed into party political areas. And what I would say is I wouldn't, to go back to a point that was made earlier, I would not condemn Jeremy Corbyn for what he said about not pressing the nuclear button. I uh, would commend him rather than condemn him, uh, condemn him for saying that. What I would condemn... No, I've just finished my point. What I, would, what I would condemn is a position where you've got, which is the Labour Party's current position, which is to say we will spend £100 billion on nuclear weapons and then we won't use them. That is also immoral. The idea, no, I won't. The idea of spending £100 Definitely. billion... Pounds the idea of spending £100 billion when we've seen the cuts that we've seen in terms of welfare, when we've seen the cuts in terms of vital services, spending £100 billion when your own position is to say you would not use the weapons, that also to me is deeply immoral. And on the question of whether the dogs in the street support Jackie Bailey's uh, position, perhaps you should have a further chat with the dogs that she's talking to because I think they perhaps have changed their mind if that's what uh, uh, she is saying. I would also say that we do, of course... Um, expect and support that uh, we should have proper investment in our defence services. We've seen far too many cuts to the conventional uh, forces, whether it's in terms of equipment or in terms of personnel. And perhaps we could have had a, a much better and more productive response to the crisis in the Mediterranean if we had some of the vessels that we could have had had we spent more money on conventional defence. So I think there are good reasons to be cautious about the UK government's projections for future personnel numbers at Faslane as well. Given that previous promises of a major uplift in the number of army personnel based in Scotland and investment in the defence estate, such as the promised new barracks at Kirk Newton, these have not materialised. As I mentioned earlier, I'd also draw attention to the April 2015 report by the STUC and the Scottish CND, Trident and Jobs, which found that more jobs, if the argument is about jobs, more jobs would be created if the same amounts of money spent on Trident were instead spent uh, in other areas of public spending. We can be in no doubt that we, we face huge cuts in terms of welfare provision in Scotland, tax credits being one of them. And we know that individuals and families in Scotland are currently experiencing the adverse consequences of those welfare reforms. Our analysis, show, our analysis shows that the impacts are especially felt or will be felt by uh, the most vulnerable in society. It's why we push for the full devolution of social security to this uh, parliament. So a more human approach can, a humane approach can be taken, which is, uh, if I have time, I will take it into it. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking the intervention and I sincerely thank Christina McKelvey for bringing this debate to the Parliament. We heard earlier today about jobs that were being lost in areas where we actually uh, look at our enterprise companies and a task force to go in and see. I think the debate over jobs at Faslane is a very serious one and I think it inhibits the argument for getting rid of Trident. Is it possible, Cabinet Secretary, that we could start now, rather than either having you know, the, the, the mistake of whether we, we're going to spend the money on, on nursing and public services or improving the uh, traditional forces? Um, I think you've made not, your point. Should we not now be absolutely making that plan, just as we would 
if jobs were being lost in another industry for all of the members, who, all of the people who work at Faslane, to know absolutely what Faslane is going to look like as a conventional base? Cabinet Secretary. I think it's a very good point that's uh, made uh, by Jean Urquhart, and I have had discussions with uh, Scottish CND uh, about this issue. Uh, there was the case, uh, Jean Urquhart made a member in the 1980s, early 1990s, when uh, the Berlin Wall fell, that we were told there was going to be a peace dividend. In fact, uh, the Labour Party used to talk about arms conversion. We've not had that conversation, and we don't have access to much of the information which is required in order to do that sensibly. What we have said is we are concerned about jobs. We would safeguard the jobs which are currently uh, at uh, Faslane by making it Scotland's uh, defence uh, base if we were to have that control. We don't have that control. And you're right, we should have discussions around that. But what's very important in relation to this is an overriding that, in my view, is the morality or otherwise of nuclear weapons. And I feel very sorry that Neil Finlay felt the best thing you could do was launch a personal and puerile and predictable attack on an SNP member as his first instinct to respond to this debate. Uh, presenting officer, the true cost of the UK government's plans for a new generation of nuclear weapons Members are, not I think, taking for all of us. interventions. Any more interventions? And I am the decider of that. He is not taking any more interventions. Cabinet so Secretary, please come to a conclusion. Plans for a new generation of nuclear weapons are all too apparent, and they, therefore we would call again on the UK Government to abandon these plans and instead focus efforts and resources on strengthening our conventional defence forces and redressing the impacts of their welfare reforms on the most vulnerable in society. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government supports this motion. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you all for taking part in this important debate. And I now suspend this meeting of Parliament until 2.30 this afternoon.